Okay, we just finished sec section 7.1 in Triola Elementary Statistics, and this is 7.2. That was on the population proportion. This is estimating a population mean. It'll be very similar in the construct, but we'll be using a t distribution rather than a normal distribution. Key concept, the main goal of the section is to present methods for using a sample mean which is x bar, to make an inference about the value of a corresponding population mean mu. There are three main concepts. The point estimate, which is called x bar. That's the point estimate of the sample mean, or single value estimate of the population mean mu. The confidence interval is a use sample data to construct an interpreted confidence interval of the true population of mean mu. And then sample size, find the sample size necessary to estimate a population mean. So estimating a population mean when the sample standard deviation is not known. So that's the case most of the time. It's mostly unknown, okay? And that's what we'll look at. We don't know the standard deviation. X bar represents the sample mean and is the point estimate of the population mean mu. And we've seen that that targets the mean. Mean targets the mean. It's not, um, it's a, it's not a bias estimator. So even the best estimate, though, gives no indication of how accurate it is. So we use a confidence interval instead of just a single value. So here's our table. We have mu is the population mean, and then that x bar is the sample mean, that point estimate. Little s will be the sample standard deviation. Number of values for n, and then e again is our margin of error. Simple random sample. Either or both of these conditions have to be satisfied. The population is normally distributed, the population, okay? Or you have to have n greater than 30. Here's our confidence interval, very similar. Mu is somewhere between our sample point estimate x bar minus the error and then that plus the error. And these are the same things just showing you interval notation or plus or minus. The margin of error formula is a little different than the proportion. It's a t, critical t value with alpha divided by 2, times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And we use a df, that's called degrees of freedom, as n minus 1. So we need that number in order to find our t critical value. So it's the critical value separating an area of alpha over 2 in the right tail of the student t distribution. Confidence level. 95% confidence is very similar that we use. <clears throat> Degrees of freedom, we said, is n minus 1. So we need to have this normality satisfied, or n is greater than 30. So it's robust against the departure from normality, which means the normality requirement is loose. The di distribution need not be perfectly bell-shaped, but it should be appear somewhat symmetric, with no outliers. So. Sample size n is greater than 30. This is a common guideline, but sample sizes of 15 to 30 are adequate if the population appears to have a distribution that is not far from being normal, and there are no outliers. For some population distributions that are extremely far from normal, the sample size might need to be larger than 30. So this text, we just kind of simplify the criteria of n being greater than 30. Here we'll use what we call a student t distribution. They call it, kind of referred to as the T distribution then, make it shorter. It was developed by William Gossett, um, who was a Guinness Brewery employee. He needed a distribution that could be used with small samples. The brewery prohibited publication of the research, result, research results, but Gossett got around this by publishing under the pseudonym Student. Here are some of the key points from the student T distribution. The T distribution is found this way. It's like a Z but it's a t distribution. And the only difference is, is that you got that standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Okay. We will be using technology, so we will not have to change into this. We will use StatCrunch, and it's a t calculator. And that is found, since I have it right here, stat calculator t. And then you'll see the, what we need, the degrees of freedom, and then you have whatever you want here, probability-wise. right? And we'll probably put our probability in here, like uh, 0 0.025, be greater than 0 0.025. And that'd be what we want to use for a critical value. 
degrees of freedom, finding the critical va value requires the degrees of freedom, and that's just n minus 1. So for example, if we have 10 test scores, have the restriction that their mean is 80, their sum must be 800. We can freely assign values to 9 scores, but that 10th score would then be determined. So in this case, there's 9 degrees of freedom. For, that, for this method, the section, the number of degrees of freedom is sample size, then minus 1, so n minus 1. Finding the critical value of t alpha divided by 2. You can use the table, but we're just going to use technology like I just showed there. The t distribution is different for different sample sizes. So look at n equals 3, n equals 12 but they do approach the green curve as n increases. So that's why we're looking for higher values of n, and it becomes more normal. The student t distribution has the same general bell shape. The student t distribution has a mean of t equals 0, just as the normal distribution has a mean of z equals 0. But the standard deviation of the t distribution varies with sample size. So that's unlike the standard normal deviation, which always has the main standard deviation of just 1. As the sample size n gets larger, the t distribution gets closer to the standard normal curve. So we're going to construct a confidence interval. The procedure is verify the two requirements are satisfied. The sample is random, and it's from a normally distributed or n greater than 30. With our population standard deviation unknown, which is usually the case, we'll use n minus 1 degrees of freedom for technology on a, for the t table and find a critical value, the t sub alpha divided by 2, that corresponds to the desired confidence level that we want. Evaluate the margin of error using e equals this right here. Use the value, then the calculated margin of error from x bar by subtracting and adding it on. And then round the resulting um, probably to three decimal places. Round confidence intervals to one more decimal place than is used for the original set. Okay, let's look at an example. First, find the critical value t sub alpha divided by 2 to a 95% confidence interval given the sample size n is equal to 15. Okay, so we're going to find that critical value. Because n is 15, the degrees of for freedom would be 14. So I'll come into here, make my degrees of freedom 14. The 95% confidence level corresponds to 0 0.05. So again, we would split that in two, divide by two, so it's 0 0.025 in each tail. So we'll make it this, make sure it's to the right. Delete that and put 0 0.025. So our confidence level doesn't isn't always the same, or excuse me, our critical value is not always the same based on the the confidence level is based on degrees of freedom. It changes. So here we see that we have 2.144 for our critical value. And you can watch a video here if you'd like to see it, see it done again. But that would be that little area right there to round up. Okay, now we're going to use a confidence interval. That was creating that critical value. Here we have some data. I can copy that into StatCrunch quickly. And what it says is listed below are weights, hectograms, of randomly selected girls at birth based on the data from the National Center of Health Statistics. Here are the summary statistics listed. We have 15 samples, 15 sample points. Our mean, x bar, is 30.9 hectograms. Our standard deviation is 2.9 hectograms. Use the sample data to construct a 95% confidence interval. We have to check the re requirements. One, it's a simple r random sample. Yes, randomly selected. Since the sample is less than 30, we need to know if it's normally distributed. Well, they give us the normal quantile plot, the QQ plot. If they didn't, we could just come in here and get that, remember, the QQ plot. Pick that, normal quantiles and then go down and click compute at the very bottom and we see that it's following the values, right? There's no pattern and they follow the line. So loosely 
normal was what we want to do approximately normally distributed okay now that we know it fits the requirements now we can use StatCrunch to find the confidence interval rather than just doing it ourselves with the long way we're going to go into StatCrunch click stat t stats because it's this is a mean go into one sample and at this question we have data so a lot of times you'll do summary but because this question has data I'm going to do with data and the data is in variable one then we're going to do down here confidence level 95 percent because that's what they wanted a 95 percent confidence and then I'm going to click compute and what we find out is we have a 29.25 and a 32.49 we are 95 percent confident that the limits 29.2 hectograms and 32.5 hectograms actually do contain the value of the population mean mu if we were to collect many different random samples of 15 like this and find the mean about 95 percent of them should contain the mean weight of newborn girls so interpreting the confidence level the confidence interval is associated with a confidence level such as 0.95 or 95 percent when interpreting a confidence level estimate of mu we know the confidence level gives a success rate of the procedure used to construct the confidence interval so for example we are 95 percent confident that the interval from 29.2 to 32 actually does contain the true value of mu I already said that so now we're going to determine sample size so just like 7.1 we want to know how, mu how many people are, do we have to um, survey to get the information for our mean well here's our mu standard deviation for the population sample mean we have E, our desired margin of error, and now we're going to have a Z alpha divided by 2. We have a Z score here. And that's going to be N, our formula. Z sub alpha divided by 2 times the standard deviation divided by E. So we'll round, again, the sample size must be a whole number, so you round up. Normally we don't know the, the population standard deviation, but there's some ways around this. In the homework you'll be given a, a population standard deviation and shown how the range rule works to estimate the population standard deviation. So here is an example of that. Assume we want to estimate the mean IQ for the population statistics students. How many statistics students must be randomly selected for IQ tests if we want 95% of the sample mean is within three IQ points of the population. For a 95% interval, we have our 0 0.05 for alpha, 95%, 0 0.05. So we know that the Z critical value is 1.96. We've done that before. But if you forgot, it's calculator normal. So this time we have to go back to normal because this is how the formula works for the for calculating n it's this formula mean is 0 standard deviation is 1 change it here and we want to know for 95 percent so there would be 5 percent 0 0.05 divided by 2 is 0 0.025 1.96 so that's where that comes from 1.96 the standard deviation because we want a sample mean to be within three IQ points of mu the stand, the margin of error is 3 Okay, so we got that, 3. And then also we can assume that the standard deviation is 15. Now the standard deviation, it's not given here. There's a few different ways of handling that because we need to know it. So one is you could use a range rule if you have some data. We don't have data here. We can start the sample collection process without knowing the standard deviation population and then use several val values and you know calculate a sample standard deviation well, here though it says estimate the value of a sa uh, population standard deviation using the results from an earlier study so for here we have a Welsher IQ test and they had a standard deviation of 15 so statistics students have IQ scores 
with a standard deviation less than 15 because they are a more homogeneous group than the people randomly selected from the population. So we're safe by using a standard deviation of 15. So in this example, we're using previous information from a previous study. So the standard deviation of 15 will either be given or you could find it in something like that. So here, that's how we're getting the standard deviation of 15. Now we're going to use the calculator and just calculate this out. Now remember, I'm going to start in the middle and work outwards, so I'm going to use the 1.96 times the 15, hit enter, divide it by the 3, which was our 3 IQ points for error, then square that number. So 96.04 we need to round up. Even though it's 0 .04, we have to round up because we need a full person. We don't want to be short, so we'd need 7, 97 people. So among the 1,000 statistics students, we need to obtain a simple random sample of at least 97 of their IQ scores with a simple random sample of only 97 statistics students. There will be 95% confident that the sample mean, X bar, is, is within three IQ points of the true population mean. Isn't that amazing? So keep in mind though, they quickly refer to this table, but it's easy to find in the normal calculator as well. This is that one from before, the 90%, 95%, 99% to get those Z values, but I can just do it in stat crunch, right, with the normal calculator. That's what we did here. Normal calculator and just put the values in, and you can get the 1.96 quickly. So I thought I would show one example here. And the instructor tip comes up. Check the requirement to see which test you will use. Is it T-STAT or Z-STAT? So why do I say that? Well, because as we move on in the semester, you have to remember when we're using the mean, we're using a T-STAT. And we're using the proportion population, we're using a Z-STAT. So here we'll be using, because we don't know, um, we also don't know the standard devi the population standard deviation. So we'd be using a T-STAT. So a data set includes 103 body temperatures of healthy adult humans having a mean of 98.1 degrees Fahrenheit and a standard deviation of 0.56 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the data set sample. Construct a 99% confidence interval of the mean body temperature of healthy humans. What does the sample suggest about the 98.6 mean body temperature? Okay, so how do we get this? It's a population mean. So I'm going to go to StatCrunch, and I'm going to open up a stat, tstat, because it's a population mean, one sample with summary. They gave us the summary. I'm going to put in the information that they gave us, which was 103 body temperatures, so that's the sample size. The sample mean was a 98.1 and the standard deviation is 0 0.56. The confidence interval that we want was a 99%. I'm going to put that in and then click Compute. So what is the confidence interval estimate for the population mean? 97.95 or 97.96 or 955 it looks like, three decimal places, and 98.245. So we're 99% confident, confident that the true mean of the population will fall in between that. So, and what does this suggest about about the use of 98.6 as a mean body temperature? Well, 98.6 actually is outside of this range, right? The true mean falls in between that. So, 98.6 is actually a little high. This suggests the mean body temperature should be lower than 98.6 because we're pretty confident, 99% of 103 data sets as we collect people, it's actually a little lower, right? That's what this is saying. So, because we're 99% confident, it falls in there. I don't know if I said 95, but 99% confident, okay? So that's what I would be doing. The, long, the longer way would be to do this by, by hand and find the, the point estimate and use the error to go back, to, to go positive and negative. But I'm just using StackCrunch because it's much, much quicker. Okay, hope that helps. Let me know if you have any questions in discussion.